If you're building a high-end workstation with lots of PCI Express storage, 110 millimeter M.2, Kyoxia CD6, PCI Express 4, U.2, U.3, maybe you're gonna go for the new ruler form factor. Wait, isn't that M.2? No, for a lot of reasons. Maybe you've got a P5800X Optane, and because you don't have a good PCI Express 4 connection, you're gonna run those U.2 drives on an expansion card like this, which converts it to a PCI Express by eight slot. There's options, or maybe just the single to PCI Express 4, you plug in your U.2 drive there, you're good to go. IC Dock has a lot of products, but before we talk about IC Dock's products, I wanna teach you a little bit about PCI Express, PCI Express and workstations, and your options. Because you can go for RAID. This is an eight bay RAIDable enclosure for M.2 that you can put in a five and a quarter inch bay. So it'll hold eight M.2s with great cooling and a five and a quarter inch bay, and we'll get to that. But I'm actually gonna give away one of these. This goes on the back of your computer and gives you a removable slot for an M.2. This is great for servers and this is great for workstations. But let's dive in. <music> So if you've been watching our videos lately, we've got two really high, well, three really high-end systems. We have our Epic servers, 7763 and 75F3, that we've been showing with uh, Gigabyte motherboards. Thanks, Gigabyte. We've also got our really high-end Threadripper Pro workstations with Asus WRX80 and Gigabyte WRX80 uh, you know, chipsets and our Threadripper Pro CPUs. And then we've also got Xeon, the Intel Xeon, the 8380, the top of the line Xeon Platinum CPUs. And that is in a desktop motherboard. Yes, uh, that's in a super micro motherboard, I do believe the supply chain is super weird right now. So yeah, all of those. I mean, you've got a ton of PCI Express lanes with those Xeons. Of course, you've got 128 PCI Express lanes with Epic and Threadripper Pro. There's not physically enough room for slots in that board. So board manufacturers make those PCIe lanes available in other connectors. Enter the other connectors on the desk before me. So take for example, the Asus WRX80. It has two PCI Express 4 U.2 connections at the front edge of the motherboard. Now some motherboards will have similar connections, but they're not actually U.2, they don't carry PCI Express. They'll carry SATA. Tyan is one of those. Tyan on their desktop Epic board has three of those connectors, but they're really meant for SATA. Not to despair, they do have slim SAS connections, and the slim SAS connections have a much better signal to noise ratio, so they do better with signaling for like PCI Express 4. PCI Express 4 is very hard. How do you connect it to a drive? So if you've got the Asus WRX80 motherboard, you've got a cable like this. We've got the SFF connector on this side, and a different SFF connector on this side, it plugs into the drive, and then this plugs into the motherboard. It's pretty traditional. The problem, this sort of bluish colored cable is actually PCI Express 3. If you use this, because you've got PCI Express 4 on the motherboard side, and this device is capable of PCI Express 4, they'll try to negotiate a PCI Express 4. It won't work, best case scenario. Worst case scenario, it will work, but will be flaky and terrible. It will lead to crashes and your machine being mysteriously unstable. And until you dig into the logs, you won't notice that your computer's correcting a lot of hardware errors. The easiest way to deal with that is to get an add-in card like this one. <laughs> Not all of these are PCI Express 4, but these are more readily available than PCI Express 4 cables, which we'll talk about in a second. This card is capable of PCI Express 4, but another identical card that looks like this is not capable of PCI Express 4. So what you can do is actually mount your Kyoxia U.2 drive to this PCI Express card and then install that in your computer. <laughs> if you're fabulously ancient, you may remember the hard cards of the 1980s. This is basically the U.2 equivalent and the only reason we have to do this is to maintain PCI Express 4 signal integrity. Now PCI Express 4 cabling is entering mass manufacture and I just barely, I ordered these in July. July and it's uh, November basically and they just came in. I got four of them. I wish I'd bought more. This cable is actually capable of PCI Express 4. They've uh, they sort of cheated a little bit. They've put some redrivers actually in the connector. So, uh, but hey, it works. It works with the WRX80 motherboard and it works with my Kyoxia CD6 PCI Express 4 uh, NVMe. And it also works with the Intel Optane P5800X, which is my favorite piece of Optane technology right now. So I can use a P5800X without it taking up an expansion slot on my WRX80 motherboard, 
as I would. So I've got seven slots on that motherboard and I can connect this super high speed U.2 without actually taking up an expansion slot. That is fabulous. So in that vein, let's take a look at this because this gives you even more options. This connects the drive, but it's gonna be buried somewhere inside the case. It's not super convenient. If you remember the wood grain build that I did with Threadripper a little while ago, that Fractal Define XL case, that's a nice case. And it also has two five and a quarter inch bays. What did I put in those five and a quarter inch bays? I put the PCI Express 3 version of this. It's four U.2 bays. This one has four slim SAS connections because this one is PCI Express 4 capable. In fact, that's how I was introduced to IC Dock. I ordered one of these. They're like $400 plus. Uh, I ordered it for my Threadripper system because I had multiple U.2 drives and I wanted to make sure that they had adequate cooling. This has active cooling at the back, it's nice. And uh, you know, cause I work on enterprise stuff, I'm probably gonna be swapping in different U.2 drives depending on whatever it is that I'm working on. So I asked, I was like, hey, you got any PCI Express 4 versions? Because I'm on Threadripper Pro, I need something with PCI Express 4. And the answer was no, but we're working on it. Well, here it is. This is the MB699 VPB V2. V2 PCI Express 4, look for your connections. So you will need special cables for this. And no, you don't get the cables. This needs SFF 8654 to SFF 8611. That's the simplest solution. Again, that's gotta match the connector that you wanna match on the other side, but there you go. I've also got two RAID controllers, the SSD 7580 from High Point, that's PCI Express 4. That was also delayed almost three months. So that high point RAID controller is gonna be a lot of fun to play with, I think, and take a look, because a lot of people are like, NVMe RAID, and, and I'm over here just saying, software RAID is fine, especially with the work that uh, Jens has been doing on the Linux kernel, 10 million IOPS per core, that's 5 million IOPS per thread, 10 million IOPS per core on the P5800X, that is all the performance that you will need for a software-based RAID solution that doesn't impact the workload that you're running in your multi-core environment. But this is great. You have four bays. Depending on the controller and the thing that you connect it to, it is potentially hot swap capable. Based on my testing, I don't think the ASUS WRX80 motherboard was designed to hot swap NVMe. It uh, freaks out. Don't do that. You can shut it down, swap drives, boot it back up, and everything is pretty good. One important thing is it does maintain the drive numbering. Both the Gigabyte motherboard and the ASUS motherboard will maintain the drive numbering as best it can. So like if you're booting off of like hard drive five and you remove hard drive six, sometimes the ordering is reset. So like what showed up as NVMe two, later will show up as like NVMe three or four. That was a problem I ran into with the Supermicro server motherboard, but didn't seem to exist on the WRX80 motherboards, nor the Xeon motherboards. The Xeon seems to do a really good job uh, managing the device enumeration in the system. So those work really well with this. If you notice on the layout of those motherboards, there's all those extra oddball connectors. And it's different between the, the Xeon motherboard, the Super Micro Dual Xeon motherboard, and the Epic Single Socket motherboard, and the Gigabyte motherboard. All of those connectors are different. Each motherboard manufacturer has opted for a different kind of connection. ASRock on their ITX motherboard uses a slim, slim SAS connection that doesn't even have locking connectors on it. So beware of that if you're gonna build an ITX Epic system. Foreshadowing. Oh, I don't know about foreshadowing, but something I'm working on, stay tuned. There's all kinds of little pitfalls and gotchas and just terrible things like that you can run into when you're building something like this or working on something like this. So you have to you know, listen to these obnoxiously long videos from somebody like me that's like, okay, here's all the stuff that I tripped over and everything exploded. And that's also a really good thing you can look into. <laughs> Someone after my own heart on the Linux forum, I'm not sure how to pronounce their usernames, like avb.normipleb, uh, they have ordered almost all of this hardware themselves and tripped over basically every landmine that you can run into. And I've been helping them and it's sort of fun to go along with their journey. But, you know, they found a lot of cables that are not compatible and, and we worked on stuff and that, that actually inspired me to order a few of the things that I needed to sort of glue things together because PCI Express is the future. Now, a more pedestrian solution that is much lower cost is the MB840 M2PB. And I'm actually gonna give this away. And there's gonna be a couple of IC doc videos. So if you wanna enter, there's a link to the forum thread below. You just go comment and tell me what you would do with it. This is like this, but it's nicer. So like this is from China and this is cheap. Well, it was cheap before, you know, the global situation. IC doc has done these up and they've done them up nice. Big heat sink. It is PCI Express 3 compatible though, not PCI Express 4, keep that in mind. Expansion slot. 
Yes. M.2. M.2 mounted in a nice big heat sink, accessible from an expansion slot. The box also includes a half height back plate. So if you're gonna use this in a half height expansion slot, such as you would find in a micro desktop or a server, servers typically have half height slots, this will work great. It is PCI Express by four. I would love to see ICDoc do a version of these that has dual M.2. That might be a thing actually by the time you're doing this video, you're gonna have to browse ICDoc's website to see, but I'm giving this away. A lot of fun. This test is great, by the way, even with the Samsung 970 running full tilt, which, you know, Samsung, they, they play it fast and loose with the power specs on their M.2. They, they use a little more power than they're supposed to, and that means more heat, and this thing was able to deal with it, so good job, Icy Dog. I've got two of those, because that's how we roll when we're testing. All right, the piece de resistance. Now this uses the same type of cables as the PCI Express 4 U.2, but instead of being for U.2, it's eight NVMe, and look at that. Now I know what you're thinking. This is gonna be one of those 80 millimeter only devices, right? Wrong, 110 millimeter. Look at that, fits like a glove. This comes with thermal pads and all the stuff that you need to actually mount these. You got eight two terabyte NVMe, you got 16 terabytes of flash storage, and you can rate it however you want. You can use Linux LVM, you can set up RAID 5, RAID 10, RAID 6, whatever configuration you want. And you've got eight of those SFF connectors on the back, same connector as the U.2 version. Dual cooling fans, you can use a, a switch to specify if it's low, medium, or high. And again, M.2 is not designed for hot swap. If you look very closely at the card edge connector of the M.2, every single gold pin is exactly the same length. That's not the only reason, but that's one of the main reasons why M.2 can never really truly be hot swap or, you know, you can, you know, it's for hot plug it in. If you look at even your lowly SATA hard drive, it actually has different length pins. And the reason for that is so the ground is connected first. If you look at your U.2, your U.2 is designed exactly the same way. Some of the pins are different lengths and it's designed explicitly to support hot plug. What about the new ruler format? This is one of the short ruler. It's, it's not really that much bigger than M.2. It gives you a little bit more thickness. You can have a little bit more of a built-in heat sink but its connection also has different length gold pins to better support hot swap, hot plug. This does not support hot plug. Do not attempt it, you will ruin your devices. Just FYI. You can get adapters too. So like here's my ruler format. That's plugged in there. This is EDSFF or the ruler format. And so now this thing will run on a U.2 connection. It's just a passive printed circuit board that sort of sticks out the front. The ruler format in the enterprise is not really catching on all that great. It's really popular in 1U because in a 1U server, it's really easy to have an array of these across the front of the 1U server uh, turned you know, vertically like this. And that's the most popular place that I've seen them. But U.2 drives like these you know, in the enterprise are readily available in like 16 terabyte capacities. Keoxia actually has some of those. And this has been more popular because it's cheaper and easier to produce this in 16 terabyte capacities than this. This is really nice for speed and density. This is really nice for gobs of storage, but it's not quite as fast as having a, a much larger physical number of these. But keep in mind, we, we only have 128 PCIe lanes on the CPU socket. So having a bunch of these having their own dedicated four lane link, you start to run out of lanes pretty quickly. So maybe it makes sense for a 1U, but this is, the industry seems really happy with uh, <laughs> this format for flash and packing in 16 terabytes in this is easier than packing in 16 terabytes in, in this. So if you need that kind of stuff, check that out. ICDoc has a lot of that. And they also, you know, if you didn't catch our last video, ICDoc has a 24 drive, 24 two and a half inch drive uh, breakout enclosure that takes up three five and a quarter inch bays, but will give you 24 two and a half inch seven millimeter drive bays and that is very nice for building a, a small server that uh, physically has to be very, very small, but uses a lot of relatively low cost flash because four terabytes of, of SATA flash is way cheaper than four terabytes of M.2 flash and is basically cheaper than M.2 price, even in, uh, pricing even in bulk. Now street pricing on Amazon, New Egg, what you get there, that's gonna vary. But when you're buying 100 or 500 of these drives at a time, there's, there's some options. I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been a quick rundown of some of the cool stuff from IC Doc that you might not have been aware of. 
you know, if you're having PCI Express 4 problems, cheap cards like this, or if you want to be able to easily remove your M.2 for testing or diagnostics or whatever in the bay. I really like what ICDoc is doing to make this kind of connectivity available. It is great for test machines, it's great for servers, it's great for higher end workstations. If you're gonna have uh, specialized cooling for your U.2 and you need a lot of U.2 devices, you're gonna run a software RAID. This is great for RAID 10, because you can run two devices in a, uh, in a stripe and then mirror those, or two devices in a mirror and then stripe that. And um, that's, an, that's a nice experience, depending on, again, what sort of workload that you're running on a really high-end system. So, I'm Little, this is Level 1. This has been a quick look at some ICDoc stuff. I'm signing out, and you can find me in the Level 1 forums. Remember, tell me what you do, and, you know, maybe get subscribed so you can look at the, uh, the future video that we've got coming for some of this stuff. I'm signing out, and I'll see you in the forums.